Okay, awesome. So we're going to get into some GI and GU content. Um, overall, general idea, GI and GU, think pump problem. What is happening? So that's kind of a good way to um, kind of start things off. So first, we're just going to do a little bit of an overview um, of our renal system. So um, what is the big deal about the kidneys? Well, our kidneys really have many important roles. They are known for helping to maintain our blood pressure. Remember the good old fashioned RAS system. Whenever our blood pressure gets dropped, the kidneys secrete renin. That's going to help us conserve water to help increase our blood pressure. And they also um, function in excreting fluids, wastes, electrolytes, everything our body currently doesn't need. It helps maintain that homeostasis, that balance. So it's going to um, help balance and regulate all of our really important electrolytes. Um, also, our pH buffer systems, kidneys. Remember um, our metabolic acidosis, metabolic alkalosis? Well, the kidneys act as our buffer system. Um, and also, they help with glucose. So very, very important functions. Um, when we think about what is doing the work, that's going to be our nephrons, aka the functional unit of the kidneys. These really help us pull wastes from the blood and help us remove it to excrete. So what's doing the filtering? Filtering that's actually going to be our glomeruli, because um, we have two of them, and they're going to help us um, really filter our blood and remove it as waste. How do we get rid of waste? The urine. When we talk about our GFR, this is our glomerular filtration rate. This is a really good um, thing to kind of keep in mind when you're in the clinical setting. This usually can be found in your patient's lab values. All this does is tells us how well our kidneys are filtering. Therefore, if our kidneys have good filtering, that means they're functioning good. If we see our GFR start to dip lower and lower and lower, that means my kidneys aren't functioning the way they should. And if my kidneys can't function, we talked about all the important things kidneys do. If my kidneys aren't functioning, they can't do what they're meant to do to help filter and to help maintain a nice balance. Um, as our GFR decreases, keep in mind, once we lose kidney function, we cannot get it back, like with our, our chronic kidney disease. So once we see our GFR kind of dip lower and lower and lower in the chronic cases, we're really not going to be able to get that, that function back. So some of our important hormones um, with our kidneys, we have our ADH, antidiuretic hormone, our anti-P hormone. Um, this acts on the kidneys to help our kidneys kind of conserve water and not absorb it, and not absorb water and not excrete it. Um, aldosterone saves sodium and pitches potassium. Again, it helps regulate that sodium and water. Balance. Our natriuretic peptides, these are our inhibitors. They inhibit the secretion of renin and aldosterone. So um, if my blood pressure was really, really low and um, renin and aldosterone came, saved the day, my blood pressure went up, well, to stop me from getting hypertensive, a and P and BNP are going to be released in order to kind of inhibit all of that action. And then finally, our diuretics, they just really help us excrete fluids. Let's talk about some pathophysiological uh, processes. One of our really common ones are going to be our urinary tract obstructions. And um, when we think our upper, think above the bladder. So what's happening is that there's an obstruction. It's usually on that ureter, that um, kind of long piece. And why is this a concern? Well, it's going to cause a backup of urine. And if my obstruction is higher up on my ureter, that doesn't give a lot of room for that urine to kind of go down, if that makes sense. So if that backup of urine can actually cause it to back up all the way into the kidney, into the nephron, into the glomeruli, and now what happens? All that fluid, that pressure is going to damage my nephron wrong, damage my glomeruli, damage my kidney. And what happens when I have kidney damage? A whole lot of problems. 
Um, our lower obstructions, these are a bit more common. Um, this is going to involve things below the bladder, usually like our urethra and males if their prostate is enlarged. Now this, it's still an issue. However, you do have some more time to kind of treat this um, because it's not close to the kidneys yet. So just keep that in mind. Um, kidney stones are one of our most common causes of our obstructions. Lots of different risk factors, um, specifically diets high in protein, salt, sugar, just being dehydrated um, are really big in kind of what, what's causing kidney stones. Um, all of our symptoms are usually dependent on location. So as um, nurses, we can kind of figure out where this stone is just based on how my patient is presenting. So if they're having more of an upper, think above the bladder, you're gonna see more renal colic. All colic means is comes and goes. So if you have colicky pain, pain that comes and goes. So severe flank pain that comes and goes, usually over our CVA, our angle, or uh, hematuria. If we have a lower kidney stone, this one we're gonna see more um, urine related symptoms. Um, so yeah. Overactive bladder, this is not a um, structural issue in terms of um, like a blockage. Essentially what's happening is my bladder muscle works out so much. It's just way too active, it's doing its thing, but because it's so active, it gets pretty weak. Think about it, if I'm working out a lot, let's say I hit legs in the gym, and it's a day later, I'm doing the waddle. I'm having a hard time walking. Um, that's kind of what our overactive bladder is. So all this overactivity actually weakens the muscle. Um, so if my muscle is weak, I'm gonna have frequency. I'm going to have to, I'm gonna feel like I have to urinate a lot because my, my detrusor muscle isn't strong enough to kind of hold all that urine in my bladder. Um, UTIs, these are our urinary tract infections. Most common causes, usually like your irritants, if you take like baths with lots of like scented bath bombs, things like that. E. coli is very common. Why? Just because of the proximity of the urethra to the anus when we're pooping, um, et cetera. When we talk about uncomplicated UTIs, think normal. This is just what your quote unquote normal UTIs are, meaning not wiping um, front to back, you know, um, SPIs, things like that. Our complicated UTIs, think structural problem. There's an issue with the anatomy of my urinary tract. There's more underlying factors, and that's really going to be key in differentiating between uncomplicated versus complicated. So glomerulonephritis. So we talked a little bit earlier about how important our glomeruli are. What happens with this is that there is any infection, destruction, inflammation, et cetera, occurring here. Um, therefore, it leaves my glomeruli not to function as well because they're swollen, they're inflamed, they're not having a good time. So what happens is toxins, wastes, and fluids don't get properly filtered. So I'm going to have lots of swelling, lots of fatigue. And just keep that in mind. Um, usually our risk factors are if my patients had a recent strep infection. So just remember that. Um, this kind of goes into our GFR. Um, but essentially, when my patient is having a decrease in their kidney function, we really need to monitor um, when we're having renal insufficiency, my GFR is still, it's not normal because remember our normal was a lot higher, kind of that 65 to 90. Um, but with our renal insufficiency, we're still having a GFR. We're still filtering, but I'm starting to see a little bit of a creep up in my creatinine and a little bit of a creep up in my urea. However, when I have renal failure, this is when I have Dr drastic loss of kidney function and my GFR will actually be less than 15. At this point, the, um, the kidneys can no longer produce urine and I will have to undergo dialysis. Um, uremia, this is renal failure that includes all of that elevated toxins, my elevated urea. 
my elevated creatinine, et cetera. And you're going to start to see these neuro changes because of all these toxins building up in my body. Um, azotemia, this is increased nitrogen levels um, really caused by that renal insufficiency. So those are just a few key terms. Um, so we talked a lot about chronic, chronic kidney disease. Well, what about an acute kidney injury? Acute kidney injury can lead to acute kidney failure, um, but how do we classify the injury? We classify it based on what's going on with kidney, what and where is affecting the kidney. So if I have a pre-renal um, AKI, there's an issue with renal perfusion meaning blood, oxygen, nutrients couldn't get to my kidney. Therefore, my kidney's not going to function if it doesn't have proper oxygen, proper nutrients, et cetera. Um, so think blood um, with our pre-renal injury. If I've had massive fluid loss, massive hemorrhage, et cetera, decreased cardiac output at any point, if your patient goes into shock, um, they're at risk for a pre-renal injury and AKI. Now, if I have an intrarenal, think inside the renal. Um, so this is direct injury to the kidney, blunt force trauma to the kidney, um, drugs that are pretty nephrotoxic, et cetera, actually physically damaging my kidney. And our post-renal injury, we talked a lot about our urethral um, urinary tract obstructions. Um, if we have an upper UTI, remember it's high up kind of on that, um, and kind of like your ureters. And all that water and urine is going to get pushed back into the kidney, and that's going to damage your kidney. So that's what a post-renal injury would be. Flipping it back to chronic renal failure, again, with this, it's a chronic disease, meaning progressive loss of renal function, really associated with our systemic disease, unmanaged hypertension, diabetes, uh, mellitus, talk a lot about polycystic kidney disease, et cetera. And just know that when we classify it, stage one through five, if I was at stage one and now I bumped up to stage two, I can never go back to stage one. So it's progressive. So just really keep that in mind. And stage four or five, this is what we call end stage renal disease, meaning my kidneys cannot function whatsoever. I'm not producing urine. These patients will not pee. Therefore, they will have to be on severe fluid restriction, severe sodium, potassium restrictions, all the above, and they will ultimately undergo dialysis. Um, which we will talk a lot about in Complex Health 1. So how does my renal failure affect my body? I listed a couple um, things to kind of reinforce the concept of just how important the kidneys are. Um, they affect our cardiovascular system, our pulmonary system, hematological immune system, even our neurosystem, GI, endocrine, reproductive, etc. cetera. Um, so you guys have a copy of this if you'd like to um, just review. So uh, let's talk about our pediatric population. So usually a lot of our um, GU issues with our pediatric population is going to be more structural. Um, so one of our more common ones is going to be hypospadias. Essentially, the urethra um, in males is just not where it should be. Um, it can be in a, a bunch of different places, um, but just think about it's not where it should be, which might make urination a little bit difficult. When we talk about our OBJ obstruction, um, this blockage essentially occurs between the ureter and the renal pelvis. However, this is different from our, um, this is different from more of our physical obstruction, such as our renal calculi, because this is actually an anatomical issue. So similar concept as it, if there were to be a kidney stone, kind of lodged in this ureter, but instead there's actually a kind of stricture that's causing the issue. Urinary incontinence is pretty common with kids. Um, you know, kids have bedwetting episodes, et cetera, but when we classify urinary incontinence, this is when it starts becoming unacceptable for these kids to be wetting the bed. Um, usually there's lots of different factors that can kind of contribute to this, um, but just know that maybe, again, with this variety of factors you have, maybe your kid just drank a lot, um, that's usually the most common one, but any sort of CNS trauma, seizures, developmental delay, etc., 
um, our adverse childhood experiences, one of the first kind of indicators that someone might be having an ACE and is regressing is you'll start to see bedwetting happen again. Um, so just kind of keep a couple of those things in mind. So now we're going to talk about some alterations in our reproductive function. Um, so with PID, this is our pelvic inflammatory disease. Usually it's preceded by a chlamydia or a gonorrhea infection. Um, and it really, and again, this infection kind of travels up the urinary tract all the way into our pelvis. Um, so really many risk factors, um, but mainly it's going to be kind of those STDs. Um, usually they're going to have fever, pain during sex. Um, and it's really important that we educate these patients to seek treatment um, because if not, it can lead to infertility and ectopic pregnancy as the scar tissue from this inflammation begins to build up in the uterus. Um, usually treated pretty well with antibiotics, but in more of our advanced progressive stages, possible surgery and hysterectomy. Our cystocele, this is a type of pelvic organ prolapse, but essentially the bladder wall protrudes into the um, vaginal canal. And this is a pretty big issue because it can cause lots of pain, um, lots of urine, urinary symptoms, um, et cetera. Usually it's kind of aggravated by vigorous activity. Like if you're running, jogging, things like that, sneezing, coughing, straining, um, most cases kind of comes and goes on its own, usually rest and kind of lying in that recumbent prone position. Endometriosis is our inflammation of the endometrial tissue outside the uterus. So when we have our PID, pelvic inflammatory disease, that's more involving the uterus. But our endometriosis, this is the tissue outside the uterus. And this tissue actually responds to our hormonal fluctuations. It's, it's pretty important. Um, the cause is pretty much poorly understood. We can see a couple different links, family history, et cetera. Um, but these patients are going to have lots and lots of pain and issues with fertility. Another big thing to kind of advocate for is making sure that they get their ovarian cancer screenings because they are more at risk. Um, so for treatment, really giving them NSAIDs for the pain and inflammation, um, hormone therapy, and then um, probable hysterectomy as well. When we talk about disorders of our male reproductive um, system, usually they're going to be more um, structural and not really organ-based. Um, our variceal, this is a medical emergency, essentially the um, spermatic cord, that's going to be what supplies blood, oxygen, nutrients, etc. to the testes. This gets cut off. It is a medical emergency which can result in infertility if not treated. Our hydroceal, this is like scrotal swelling, um, usually from just a collection of fluid. It can be pretty uncomfortable. Um, our spermatocele, this is when fluid in the epididymis um, kind of begins to collect and can actually have um, sperm in that fluid. And BPH is pretty common. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about prostate cancer. Keep in mind, BPH, this is not prostate cancer. Um, this is benign. Essentially, our prostate gland just becomes inflamed, swollen, enlarged, etc. And as you can kind of see, the prostate surrounds the urethra. So if the prostate undergoes hyperplasia, it enlarges, it's going to actually cut off, um, not cut off, but really squeeze the urethra and make urination pretty difficult, um, et cetera. The causes are usually linked to aging and dihydrotestosterone. And just kind of keep in mind, um, we're more concerned with bladder emptying. Prostate cancer, on the other hand, is from a slow-growing adenocarcinoma. Lots of risk factors, um, usually our age, family history, et cetera. It's diagnosed via our PSA test. Um, and the signs and symptoms are going to be pretty similar to our BPH because it, it's a similar concept where that inflamed, except in this one, it's, it's a cancerous carcinoma. But again, it's still surrounding that um, your urethra, it's still impacting um, urination. So now we're going to talk about our GI system. Um, just a little bit of an overview. The GI system is a lot more than just the tummy. It starts all the way from the mouth, ends up to the anus, mouth to anus. So 
how do we digest food? That's the main, main role, main function of our GI tract is, is digesting food. So when we talk about our gastric motility, this is our peristalsis, those ways. If you think back to health assessment when we were auscultating, what are we listening for? We're listening for peristalsis. This is how food travels. It gets kind of mixed into chyme and really just travels down and down and down. Um, lots of different factors can influence this. Gastric secretions, they're going to help us aid in digestion. Um, they're really going to help us um, break down and digest food. Multiple different types of digestive enzymes, usually your bicarb, pepsin's really kind of one of the more well-known ones, um, mucus, et cetera. They all aid to just help improve our digestion. When we talk about our intestines, we have your small intestine and your large intestine. So when we talk about our small intestine, think the absorber. It's um, what is the small intestine? That's our duodenum, jejunum, and our ileum. What does the small intestine do? Really does lots of our absorption of water, salts, vitamins. It's really, when we think about what is digesting our food, it's the small intestine. Our large intestine, this really absorbs whatever's left over, but it's not key in absorbing. The function of our large intestine is to really help us transport that food out. Um, our liver, it is going to be what's going to be secreting that chyme um, or substances necessary to digest chyme, um, but the liver also has many other important functions. It helps metabolize nutrients so our bodies can use them. Um, if I eat a cheeseburger, my body doesn't know what to do with said cheeseburger, but my liver can kind of help break it down into like our carbohydrates, things like that, that my body can use. Um, amino acids my body can use. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind. The liver also help detoxify our blood, metabolize drugs, and produce glucose as well. So what is bile? Again, bile is really what's going to help us with digestion. Um, it is pretty alkaline and it's pretty bitter tasting. If anyone's accidentally kind of had reflux or accidentally spit up, that's bile. Um, but really, it's going to help, again, in our cholesterol and lipid absorption, excretion, etc. Bilirubin is a little bit different. Um, this is, again, more involved with our liver. Um, but what bilir bilirubin is, it's a byproduct of the destruction of old red blood cells. So when my red blood cells break down over time or if there's trauma, um, they break down and release bilirubin. And this gets metabolized by the liver and it gets excreted through the stool. So just remember, with our GI, it excretes everything, not just food. So what are some alterations? Um, whenever someone's having any sort of GI dysfunction, it usually manifests pretty similarly um, with anorexia. This is just little desire to eat. Anorexia is not the same as anorexia nervosa. Um, when we talk about anorexia, this is just my patient has little desire to eat. Um, really common in our chemo, our cancer patients. Um, they don't always have to lose weight, but usually it is associated with their weight loss as well. Nausea and retching. Retching is kind of when you're hacking, you're kind of having those dry heaves, but you're not actually producing vomit. However, usually that retching does lead to vomiting. What we're really concerned with is our fluid and electrolyte imbalances, specifically potassium and sodium, but really potassium. Um, constipation. Um, primary, this is usually more of our um, physiological issues, whether there be like an outlet obstruction, just transit. Um, but secondary, something else is actually causing this constipation. Usually our meds, our steroids, things like that, pain meds, like oxycodone, things like that, they, they cause constipation. Um, abdominal pain is also very common with our GI bleeds. Um, if I do have an upper GI bleed, I'm either going to vomit up bright red blood or have coffee ground blood. However, if I have a lower GI bleed, this is when I'm actually going to see blood in my stool because that blood is not being digested. If it was an upper bleed and it got digested, I'm not going to see it in my stool as bright red blood. Um, diarrhea, just kind of review acute versus persistent versus chronic, etc. So when we talk about GERD, 
Um, this is again a structural issue. So I have my um, LES, my lower esophageal sphincter. So if I eat food, it goes down my esophagus, it goes into my stomach. Well, when it travels down my esophagus, my esophagus opens to allow it to go into the stomach and then it closes. That is normal. But with the GERD, this LES ends up opening while my stomach's kind of churning and doing its digestive duties. So what happens, it refluxes back up, usually occurs one to two hours after eating. Um, why we're really concerned is this reflux kind of damages my esophagus, which promotes kind of cellular changes in my esophageal tissue, which can become cancerous. So that's when we talk about Barrett's esophagus. Um, the pain gets worse when lying down um, or increasing intra-abdominal pressure. This is just because it's a lot easier for that reflux to uh, go back up. Hiatal hernia. Um, this one's a little bit difficult to kind of wrap your head around, but all you kind of need to know is that really the upper part of the stomach ends up herniating into the diaphragm. Well, that can cause a lot of discomfort um, simply because I'm going to have lots of heartburn, lots of regurgitation because as it moves up into the diaphragm, it's kind of pushing everything up. So if you can just kind of remember it's just pushing everything up. That's kind of how I like to explain it. So similar to GERD, except it's not a functional issue of the LES, it's actually anatomically, my stomach is just getting, getting pushed and, and popped up. Um, our small bowel obstruction, um, this can be a really big issue um, simply because if I have an obstruction, what is my body going to do to try to compensate? It's going to increase secretions, gases, and fluids to try to help push it through. But this isn't always going to work. That's what our small bowel obstruction is. Um, so essentially, these gas and fluids begin to accumulate. Where do they accumulate? It accumulates prior to the obstruction. So if I got a nice little chest x-ray or abdominal x-ray, I would see all this fluid, all this gas probably higher up and the more ever the obstruction would be, I wouldn't see anything below that. So I would see all of that um, before the obstruction. Um, signs and symptoms, you're gonna again have that colicky. What does colicky mean? It just means it comes and goes. And um, you're gonna have this pain during those peristalsis waves. You're gonna have lots of distension, nausea, vomiting, etc. Um, we're also concerned that there might be ischemia um, if we're having kind of like cut off blood flow. Um, and this can lead to necrosis and perforation. And gastritis, um, this is just inflammation of the gastric mucosa, um, usually caused by either an H. pylori infection or NSAIDs. What do NSAIDs do? They inhibit COX-1. COX-1 is an inflammatory um, mediator, but COX-1 also acts as, um, what COX-1 does is it helps us secrete and produce protective mucosal covering, if you will. Um, so if my patient is on NSAIDs, yay, their, their pain and inflammation is, is gone, but by inhibiting COX-1, you're also inhibiting that um, protective secretion from occurring. And these patients are going to have lots of pain and at risk for GI bleeds. When we talk about our peptic ulcer disease, um, this, I really enjoy this photo because it kind of shows you a little bit more kind of what's going on. These er holes, erosions, et cetera, usually again caused by our NSAIDs. Why? No protective covering. Um, again, H. pylori. H. pylori really just likes to damage the stomach. Um, so usually these patients are going to have a lot of pain two to three hours after eating. Why? Simply because it takes food a little bit of time to go from the esophagus into the stomach, kind of into the like duodenum, et cetera, but just know that this pain occurs after eating. However, um, for whatever reason, it ends up being relieved by eating more food or um, taking acid. So just kind of keep that in mind. We talk a lot about the different types of PUD when you um, come see me in Complex Health 1, um, but just kind of think bare, bare um, minimum. Um, complications, we're always concerned for perforation, peritonitis, and septus, sepsis. So what am I going to report to the provider as a nurse? 
my patient has a fever, I'm thinking infection, perforation, rebound tenderness. Um, I've never explained rebound tenderness to you guys, but essentially if I have rebound tenderness in my tummy, if I'm pressing on my tummy, that's not going to hurt. However, once I stop touching my tummy and I take my hand off, I'm gonna feel a lot of pain, which doesn't make sense because I'm not applying pressure, but that's what rebound tenderness is. Um, also a rigid board like abdomen. Whenever you see rigid board like abdomen, think perforation, bleeds, etc. Um, a couple different malabsorption syndromes, again, issues with absorption of nutrients. So if someone has PEI, um, they usually have like a, a chronic history of GI issues, such as cystic fibrosis or pancreatitis, but essentially they just don't produce enough enzymes to help absorb anything, um, specifically fat. Um, so this unabsorbed fat ends up being secreted in stool. So if someone has steatorrhea, all that is, is fat in the stool. Or lactose intolerance, um, these patients are missing the enzyme lactase. What does lactase do? It converts lactose into simple sugars. My body doesn't know how to digest lactose, but when it's broken up into simple sugars, my body likes that. It's easy, my body can do it. If patients have lactose intolerance, all this means is that they don't have lactase. So they'll have bloating, crampy pain, diarrhea after ingesting glucose, or sorry, lactose. Luckily, um, we have lactase pills that patients can take with their food to act as that lactase to help break it down. It's not the same thing as a dairy allergy. Um, again, this is another photo I really liked of that EPI. Um, essentially, we're missing amylase, which is amylase do. It helps break down starches. Protease helps break down proteins into our amino acids. Lipase helps us break down fats. Um, so really, they're missing a lot and they're just gonna have a really hard time absorbing nutrients. Um, when we talk about ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, they're pretty similar um, in their, there's inflammation happening that's resulting in crampy pain, crampy abdominal pain with diarrhea, stools, et cetera. But how do we really differentiate them? Um, with ulcerative colitis, think excision points. So there's certain points of inflammation that are occurring in my body, um, in my um, GI tract. Therefore, think excision points. These patients would actually benefit from surgery. Um, they might remove kind of that inflamed portion, um, whether they can do kind of like, I always call it cookie cutter, where they can take to, they can take out a piece and they can sew the ends back together. They can do that, or they can insert like a ileostomy, colostomy bag, et cetera. Um, but again, exacerbations and remissions, but just with UC, just think excision points. Like I can pinpoint this point of inflammation. However, with my Crohn's disease, I'm gonna have patches of inflammation everywhere in the, everywhere. I can have it in my mouth. I can have it all the way at the bottom, anywhere. And I usually have, have more than one patch. So I have all these patches of inflammation. Therefore, surgery wouldn't be an option for these patients because you'd be having to cut out almost everything. Um, so usually, again, exacerbations and remissions, what are we gonna do? We're going to try to maintain remission and prevent exacerbations. Um, so just kind of um, remember that. Portal hypertension, um, this is hypertension, increased blood pressure, in our portal vein. Um, what does the portal vein do? It helps remove blood from the liver. What does the liver do? It helps filter our blood so if it comes in, it's gotta go out. Um, usually our causes are going to be an obstruction or blood flow impediment, um, liver cirrhosis, et cetera. Lots of different complications, uh, mainly our hepatic encephalopathy, um, which I'm not sure we'll talk about today, but we will talk about it in our final review and go a little bit more into detail with that. Esophageal varices. So these are our tortuous inflamed veins in the esophagus. Um, usually because that they're so like twisted and gorged, et cetera, we're gonna have an issue with um, blood flow. Um, really, we talked about portal hypertension. One of the most common like effects of portal hypertension is esophageal varices. Um, so really, what are we concerned with for, for esophageal varices? We're concerned for bleeds, ruptures, et cetera. 
these veins are in the esophagus. So if they rupture, I'm bleeding in my esophagus, I'm going to have a really hard time breathing. I'm probably going to aspirate, etc. Just kind of keep that in mind. Um, when we talk about jaundice, jaundice is caused by the buildup of bilirubin. Um, remember, the liver processes broken down RBCs. What's that byproduct of broken down RBCs? Well, it's our, it's our bilirubin. Um, so any issue with my liver can lead to jaundice. Um, whether we have bile flow obstruction, blunt force trauma to my liver, et cetera, or if I'm just having a lot of red blood cell breakdown that my body just can't keep up with it, it's going to cause an increase in uh, bilirubin to build up, which can be pretty toxic. That's when we start to see this jaundice, which is yellowing of the skin, um, the sclera, which are, is it's the white part of your eyes. Um, so if you ever kind of see that, you're probably going to want to get a blood culture of your patient. What's their bilirubin? What are their LFTs, their liver function tests, et cetera? In our neonates, this is a lot more common, um, especially it occurs in about 50 to 60% of our term babies. Um, usually these, these symptoms um, happen pretty early on. Um, we talked way back when in our, our hematology lecture about hemolytic disease of the newborn, but this is also pretty common. Um, usually it does subside. Um, but in the hospital, we can actually treat it with phototherapy. They're actually called little billy lights where you put the little, um, the little baby in their bassinet, not wearing any clothes, anything just kind of all out there. And you, you, they wear these little protective goggles and you just put them in there and the phototherapy helps to kind of remove that bilirubin and help it, um, be more excreted in wastes. Cause that's how, how we, how we get rid of bilirubin through stool. So. Now we're going to talk about our gallbladder. So cholithiasis, these are our gallstones. Um, many different um, types of gallstones, usually our cholesterol, um, et cetera. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, similar to how our kidney stones damage the kidney, if I have gallstones, I'm going to have damage to my gallbladder. Um, lots of risk factors. I liked the five Fs, like someone that's fair-skinned, um, fat, fluffy, female, fertile, 40, et cetera. All of these are um, risk factors for gallstones. Usually they're going to have pretty bad epigastric and upper right quadrant pain. Um, but because a lot of these gallstones are more formed by that like fatty cholesterol, um, they're going to have really bad intolerance and pain after eating pretty fatty foods. And I especially like this photo because it shows like the gallbladder in relation to our small intestine. So we have the stomach, our bile duct kind of goes into the duodenum. Um, and what does our gallbladder do? Again, it's going to help secrete those, those enzymes that help aid in digestion, um, such as bile and stuff. So that's kind of like the relation of the gallbladder to the small intestine. They, they are very, very related. Um, some more issues of the gallbladder when we have cholecystitis, this is inflammation of our gallbladder. Again, usually it's going to be caused by a gallstone lodged in that cystic duct. Um, again, it causes our gallbladder to become distended or inflamed and have a lot of pain. Really, again, similar concept with our, our kidney stones. Same thing, but now, now we're talking about our gallbladder. So interception, this is telescoping of our proximal segment of the intestine into the distal segment. Um, usually it's very common in our three-year-olds. Um, let's say mom brings in her three-year-old and three-year-old's constipated. Usually our cause of that's going to be interception, especially if we know that patient had a viral infection previously. Um, again, they're going to have pain that comes and goes in the abdomen. They're going to put their knees to their chest, vomiting, bloody stools, etc. Now, what we're really concerned about is if this, if there is a big enough obstruction, we're going to have ischemia. Up next, we have necrotizing enterocolitis. This is our medical emergency. It's almost pretty much limited to our neonates um, in the NICU, our premature infants, etc. But essentially is that there is bowel necrosis and perforation and all that bacteria goes into the 
sorry, like this bacterial infection causes all this swelling, inflammation, et cetera, that actually eats at the wall of the bowel. The bowel will then perforate, stool will begin to spill into the abdomen, massive infection, and unfortunately death. Um, so you'll kind of see feeding intolerance as one of their symptoms. This is why we advocate um, if mom is able to, to breastfeed because that breast milk has a lot of antibodies to help. Um, etc. You'll see abdominal distension and bloody stools as well and falling platelet levels. So um, just want to talk a little bit about this abdominal distension. I know you guys are going to be doing your women, children, family rotations next semester. Um, and some of you will most likely be going to the NICU um, at least once, maybe twice, um, if your facility does have one. Um, in the NICU, on your little NPW, it'll say abdominal girth. In the NICU, you're measuring an abdominal girth, I believe, once every two or four hours because this is what you are looking for. You're looking for a neck. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind. Um, now we're going to talk about a few nutritional disorders. Our celiac disease, this is an autoimmune disorder um, in the mucosal lining of our small intestine, really common in anyone that has any sort of autoimmune disorders. Genetics also do play a pretty big role. How do we diagnose it? We actually take a little piece. Usually they can do it through like um, an esophageal tube or like an enema style um, and actually go take a little small biopsy of our small intestine and we can actually test that and we can kind of see what's going on. Additional antibody screenings also do help. Um, usually our signs and symptoms are going to have massive bloating after eating gluten. Not a little bit of bloating, massive, massive bloating. And really the only treatment for these is to cut out all gluten for life. Where does gluten come from? Wheat, rye, breads, etc. Um, you can also give them corticosteroids when diet changes fail. Um, just keep in mind, these patients are at risk for osteoporosis, so advocate that they do get their screenings. Um, and it's really important to cut out gluten because if they don't, they're at risk for cancer. So what are we going to do? Advocate for safe foods. Eggs, yogurts, potatoes, fruits, and vegetables. What are we going to avoid? Wheat and rye. All right, guys, I know we kind of sped through that. Um, but that is all I have for GI and GU. Um, does anyone have any questions? <laughs>